we conclude 21 days of prayer and fasting. Uh, I know many of you were a part of that. Uh, beyond just praying, you fasted something. Maybe it was food. Maybe it was technology. Whatever it was. And I heard from several of you how difficult that was. Maybe you doing it for the first time and others that it was meaningful. Um, you learned something from it. Um, the goal of doing that, these intentional times, is that it will help you become uh, a more devoted disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, as we conclude that today, we also are going to conclude this Make Room series. We've looked at making room for God, making room for discipleship. And two weeks ago, we looked at making room for rest. And then last week, we were blessed to have John Jorgensen with us to be able to share and kind of give you guys a taste of what our students had been taught all weekend during Disciple Now and grateful that he was here. Today we're going to conclude by looking at making room for generosity. Now the background of all that we've done so far is that um, from 2 Kings that there was this woman from Shunem who sought to prepare a meal for the prophet. And then after doing so, she was convinced that he was a prophet of God. And so she went to her husband and said, let's, let's, let's build a small room on the roof with a bed and a table and a lamp and a place for him to come when he is here. And so he would stop by there. She literally made a room in her life for God to work. There's so much in this chapter that we haven't touched on. It's, it's honestly one of my favorite chapters and little sections in all of Scripture. There's so much that happens in here. Later, Elisha wants to repay her for her generosity. And as any typical man, he has no idea what to get her. So he asks his assistant, do you have any idea what she would like? And he says, well, I know that she doesn't have a son and her husband is growing old. Now, we know culturally not giving birth to a son to an heir um, would have been a source of shame for her. Not just something she wanted, but it would have been something she carried around constantly. And so he goes to her and says, hey, you're going to give birth to a son. And she basically says, don't promise something you can't do. Don't get my hopes up. But she does give birth to a son. It's, it's a bit of a miracle. As the boy grows, we're, we, we see in there that one day he's out working in the fields and he gets a really bad headache. And it's so bad that they, they take him home and he lays on his mother's lap and then he dies from it. We, we don't know exactly what it was. And so she carries the boy up and places him on the bed in the prophet's room and then goes to find Elisha. And he comes back and long story short, he raises the boy to life. Healing beyond. Resurrection. It's a miracle. I would say that when you make room for God, you make room for the miraculous. And I don't say that as some sort of a guarantee. This isn't like a pay-for-play thing. If you do this, then God will do that. We said from the beginning, we can't manipulate him. We can't force his hand. That, that's not why we do this. That's not why we fast and pray, to force God to do something that he didn't want to do or wasn't going to do. You're never going to hear me teach that if you give to God or serve God, he will reward you with health and wealth and fame or something like that. And primarily that's because that's not in the Bible. Jesus actually made it pretty clear that if we followed him, we could expect persecution and difficulty. Actually, he says this in, in Matthew chapter 4. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And then it says this is what that looks like. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The goodness of God is, is seen all around us. This general mercy is experienced by all of us, whether we acknowledge him and fear him or not. However, when you orient your life, and by that I mean your time, your money, your relationships, your work, around God, around his commands, his wisdom, his way of living, you open yourself up to more fully experience the goodness and the richness of his grace. It, it's, it's almost like you see the world more clearly the more open you are, the more room you have for God in your life. And, and most of us would attest to that. It's almost like we see the sunset differently when we are walking with Christ than when we don't. 
But I don't just mean his common grace. We're talking about divine intervention. We're talking about miracles. And we all want divine intervention, don't we? We pray for it all the time. Sometimes it's in really big ways. Um, There's a negative medical diagnosis and we pray for healing. We've all done that. We've prayed for healing. But that's divine intervention. We want God to come in. There's doesn't seem like there's going to be any other way, God. You're going to have to come in. You're going to have to in, intervene here. But we pray for it in small, insignificant ways too, right? I can't find my keys. God, will you show me where my keys are? You're asking for the God of the universe to intervene in your life and show you where your keys are. That's a, that's a miracle if God intervenes. If, you, if you're a student and you're anything like I was and you never really studied, every time there was a test, you prayed for divine intervention. God, you know, call it, seek the Lord, right? I oh, mean, we all get so close to God at midterms. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. It's always my life verse. We, we want that that divine intervention. And when we think of it that way, we see and experience the miraculous on the regular. We want that. There's so much packed into this chapter, so much miraculous activity of the work of God. Before the story that we see of this Shunammite woman, there's another widow with a large debt and her sons are going to be taken to become indentured servants to pay off the debt. And she comes to the prophet and she's desperate. And he says, well, what do you have? She says, all I have is a jar of oil. And he said, go to all your neighbors and friends and borrow as many jars as you can. So she does that. And he says, take the jar you have and start filling those jars. This seems like an absurd thing to do. I have one jar. I'll fill the next jar and then I'm done. But she keeps doing it. And the first jar doesn't run out. You may know this story until she runs out of jars. And he says, now take all of that and sell it and pay your debt. That's a miracle. We want to experience that kind of thing. You see, God is not in any way limited by your availability, by your willingness, or the amount of room you make in your life. He's not limited. The Word makes it very clear that His will cannot be stopped. He is not limited by your availability and your willingness and the amount of room you make in your life, but you are. When we talk about this idea of making room and getting ready for God to work, if, if, you, if you have read Scripture, read through the Psalms, and you will see again and again that he teaches us that God is always working. Behind the scenes, beneath the surface, he is always working. He is not in heaven saying, man, I can't wait till Carrie finally makes some room in my life so I can get something done in Farmington. Or at Farmington first. He's he's not. He's working already. He's not limited. I am. I'm limited in how much of it I can see in my life. How much of a part of it I will be. At the end of chapter 4 of 2 Kings, there's this account of a famine that strikes the land. And Elisha still wants to feed all the sons of the prophets, which is apparently a large group, maybe like 100 people. So he tells his assistant, Gehazi, to, he says, go and, and get the big pot and start making some stew. And I read that and I just kind of chuckled because I thought, you know, every kitchen has the big pot. Like Gehazi knew exactly which one. If Sarah tells me, hey, um, hey, would you get the big pot out and start some water? I know exactly which pot she's talking about. Get the big pot, start some stew. And one of the sons of the prophets goes out to gather stuff to go in the stew and he finds this this man, all these gourds, and so he says he like fills his shirt up with them and brings them back, and they cut them up, put them in the stew. The only problem is they're poisonous, and he didn't know that. And they start eating, and they cry out, and they say like they say there's sickness in the stew. This is it's poisoned. So Elisha takes some flour, throws it in the pot, and heals the stew. He heals stew, and now they can eat it. Like what kind of? That's the funniest miracle in the world. He used he healed stew, but that, that's not all. At every harvest, the farmers would bring a first fruits offering. It's one of where we get the teaching for the tithe. So think tithe. And many times this offering would consist of loaves of bread made from the grain of the first of the harvest. So 
in, there at the end, they, these farmers bring this first fruits offering, these loaves of bread. And Elisha goes, oh, great, Gehazi, take this and, and fe- continue to feed the people. And Gehazi says, this isn't enough. This isn't enough food. I can't sit this in front of 100 people. And Elisha says, everyone will eat until they're full and there's going to be leftovers. So he feeds them. And what do you know? Everybody eats till they're full and there's leftovers. Another miracle. But the miracles keep coming. You, you, you flip to chapter 5, and we see the account of Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria, a very powerful and wealthy man. But he had a problem. He had a skin disease called leprosy. And there's a servant girl in his house who has heard that there's a prophet in Israel who could heal him. And so he goes to his king and says, I hear that there's someone in Israel who can heal me. And the king says, well, go to him. And we're going to send some large gifts. Take, go to the king of Israel and, and, and basically purchase your healing. So here's what he sends. Ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And so I'll just put that in modern terminology. That'd be 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and then plus all the clothes. In today's value, just the silver and gold it's just under $4 million that he brings. Um, Naaman is an important person. Because I'm thinking right now, I don't know anybody who would drop $4 million to buy my healing. They'd be like, you've had a good life, <laughs> honestly. And he comes to the king, but the king kind of freaks out because he's thinking, well, I, I can't heal anybody. How am I supposed to heal someone? And he thinks they're going to try to start a war with him. And it says he rends his clothing. He's, he's so scared and distraught over this. And Elisha hears about it, and he offers to handle it. He says, send him to see me. So Naaman goes to see him. and He arrives, and his assistant greets him, and Elisha doesn't even come outside to greet him. He just says, tell him to go down to the Jordan River and wash seven times, and he'll be healed. And Naaman's greatly offended. He says, you know, we have better rivers where I came from. You want me to go in this dirty river and wash? And his servants finally convince him, listen, if he told you to do something really hard and complicated, you would have done it. He's giving you a really simple, really simple procedure. Just do what the man says. So he does, and he's healed. And he comes back, and he brings those same gifts and wants to offer them to Elisha, and Elisha refuses. He refuses the gifts. He couldn't be bought. He wanted to heal him. He wanted to serve him. He wanted to give something. He didn't want to receive. Um, but the same couldn't be said for his assistant, Gehazi. It says this, after Naaman traveled a short distance from Elisha, Gehazi, the attendant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, my master has let this Aramean Naaman off lightly by not accepting from him what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. He just didn't get it. He saw all the gold and the silver, and he, he just, he's seeing money signs. He's hearing ka-ching, ka-ching over and over, and it just starts to eat at him. And he, he wants to get something for himself. So it says he pursues Naaman, and when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and asked, is everything all right? And Gehazi said, it's all right. My master sent me to say, I have just now discovered that two young men from the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing. But Naaman insisted, please accept 150 pounds. He urged Gehazi and then packed 150 pounds of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing. Naaman gave them to two of his attendants who carried them ahead of Gehazi. And when Gehazi came to the hill, he took the gifts from them and deposited them in the house. Then he dismissed the men and they left. There's something going on here that's bigger than piles of silver and gold and, and Gucci or whatever other brand of clothing would be so desirable to you. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so human desire is never satisfied. What we see here is greed. Greed creeps in, and when it grows, it does at least three things to us, and we see them in Gehazi. 
The first thing is that it consumes you. He sees Elisha turn down the gifts. And I just imagine him in the background going, what? What are you doing? He says, after he traveled a short distance, he thought, my masters, let this Aramean name and off lightly. As the Lord lives, I will run and get something from him. It began to consume him, so much so that he acted on it. He wanted it so badly that he, that he acted on it. He ran after him. And it's interesting, he says, my master has let this Aramean name him. Almost as though he's looking down on him. Man, if there's anybody we should have taken money from, it's that guy. He's not even one of us. I get it if you don't want to accept payment from someone in Israel, but he's not even one of us. He's a foreigner. You should absolutely take. I can't believe you let him off so easy. I'm going to go and get something. Greed will consume you, and then it makes you do things that you never thought you would. You start to move the lines of what's acceptable. Gehazi said after Naaman asked him, is everything all right? He says, it's all right. Uh, my master has sent me. No, he didn't. He lied. And he tried to not only lie, but he tried to cover his lie with something that looked noble. Two men have just come. Could you, could you give me something for them? Did he want something for them? No, they weren't even real. He made them up. He wanted something for himself. And so Naaman gave them the 150 pounds of silver and the two sets of clothing to two of his attendants who carried them ahead. And greed makes you hide and deceive. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the gifts from them and deposited them in the house. And then he dismissed the man and they left. And Gehazi came and stood by his master. It's almost as though he did all of this and then he came and slipped right back in to where he was. And Elisha said, where did you go, Gehazi? And he replied, who, me? I've been here the whole time. Okay, that's not exactly what he said. He said, your servant didn't go anywhere. And immediately Elisha busts him. He says, and my heart didn't go when the man got down from his chariot to meet you. It's, it's like he forgot who he worked for. Is this a time to accept silver and clothing and olive orchards and vineyards and flocks and herds and male and female slaves? Therefore, Naaman's skin disease will cling to you and your descendants forever. So Gehazi went out from his presence, diseased, resembling snow. Jesus warned us about the power of greed in Luke 12. He told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Some translations render that all kinds of greed. I think there are different kinds of greed. When I say greed, probably one of these comes to your mind, maybe two, but probably not all three. Think of it this way. There's greed that's about the stuff that I want that I don't have. There's greed about the stuff that I have. I want to hold on to what I have. And then there's stuff that I'm afraid to lose. And it consumes you and it makes you do things that you maybe even said you would never do. And it makes you hide and deceive. And Jesus said, be on guard against it. So how do we do that? How do we guard against greed? Paul te teaches us that the first thing we must do is learn contentment. In Philippians 4, 11 through 13, it says, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. And here's the secret. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, I know for many of you, Philippians 4.13 has been your life first, and you just found out it doesn't mean what you thought it meant. It, it has nothing to do with your football team winning the state championship or you being able to stick to your diet. And it has everything to do with you learning to be content in whatever situation you find yourself in. 
greed grabs a hold of us, and it could be the stuff that I, that I want that I don't have, and I will scheme and connive, and I will go into debt, and I will do whatever I have to do to get what I don't have. It could be about the stuff that I already do have, and I become stingy. You know people like that, right? None of y'all, but you know people like that, that you know, you, know, you pinch a penny so tight, and you figure your tip to the, to the penny, and you never give more than 10%. And some of you know people like that because you sit across the table from them and go, oh, I can't believe that. Could you just, the clinging to what they have. And then there's some that, that they have stuff and they're afraid to lose it. So the way they manage what they have, the way they think about it, the way they approach their possessions, it's out of fear of losing what they have. And Paul says, I've learned how to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself. And it's really interesting. He says, I know how to make do with little. Can I just get a show of hands? How many of you have had to make do with little? Okay. And then he says, and I know how to make do with a lot. Some of you are thinking, I would like to try that. How do I? It's just, it's the exact same language. I know how to make do with a little. I know how to make do with a lot. It's been said that most of us, we fail the test of abundance more than we do the test of scarcity. Oh, I know how to make do with a little. It's what do we do? How do we make do with a lot? I've learned the secrets. He's learned contentment. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, he stays the same. His attitude is the same. The way he lives is the same. His approach to all of this stuff, whether he has more than he needs or barely enough, is the same. You have to learn contentment, and that comes down to trusting in Jesus. I can do all of this through the one who strengthens me, through Jesus. Some of you are thinking, if I had a little bit more, then I would be content. That's not how contentment works. You're thinking that all you needed to be able to do is learn how to do to, to make do with a little bit more. You have to learn contentment. But the other thing you have to do is you have to pursue community. You, you, you don't need to be trying to do this on your own. Ecclesiastes says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person, keep lo- keep, how can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. And a cord of three strands is not easily broken. We need friends. We need people who can tell us the truth, who can point out our failures, who can show us our blind spots, who can tell us when greed is beginning to creep in. Because no one wakes up one day and says, starting today, I'm going to be greedy. I'm just going to be consumed with stuff that I want that I don't have. Or I, I'm going to, starting today, I'm going to hold on to everything I have and I'm never going to give anyone anything. You don't, you don't wake up and decide that. It creeps in. And it's wired into everything that we see, isn't it? Tonight, there's a relatively big football game that's going to be on. You may have heard of it. It's called the Super Bowl. And most of you don't care about the game. But many of you will say, I can't wait to see the commercials. They're so creative, Right? They win awards for these things. And then there's always scandal over a commercial that was banned and not shown and whatever. And all of them are wired and built and put together and produced to sell you stuff you don't have, don't need, and didn't even know you wanted. It's just, it's, it's in everything. It creeps in and we need others to, to point that out, to pick us up when we fall, to encourage us to stay faithful. We need mentors to, to teach us and to guide us, and that's the beauty of the body of Christ, is that we have people within this body who have been there and done that and can tell us why we should never go there and do that. Honestly, right now we've got over 100 people going through Financial Peace University together. We're, we're in week four. The group that Sarah and I are a part of, it's awesome because there are people that are young and there are people that are a little bit older. There are people who are on their way and others who have already been there. We need that. We need to learn contentment. We need to pursue community and then we need to make room for generosity. Isaiah 32, 8 says, generous people plan to do what is generous and they stand firm in their generosity. You have to plan. It doesn't happen by accident. 
True generosity doesn't happen on a whim. There are going to be things that pop up, spontaneous, and you're going to have the opportunity to be, we know about spontaneous, right? Some of you are very spontaneous. You're the reason why Walmart puts all that stuff right at the checkout, because they know you're coming. We were in line the other day, there's a guy in front of us, and he's he's almost done. It's a self-checkout, right? He's almost done. He turns, and he grabs like four little bags of chips. They're like two bucks a piece. And I bumped Sarah, and she goes, what? And I was like, he could have bought like two massive bags for that. She said, why do you care? And I said, well, I don't. It's just, it's just foolish. Like, I don't care if the best deal in the store is right by the register. I'm not buying it. You put it in the back. You make me work for it. We know about that kind of spontaneity, right? It's the spontaneity where you're, you're watching TV at night, and then all of a sudden you hear Sarah McLaughlin, and you see sad puppies on the screen, and you think, I need to give to help the sad puppies because no one else cares. And some of you right now, if you give to that, I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying for for many of us, that's how we approach generosity. It's spur of the moment, it's a whim. And we almost act like that's more noble. Oh, it's just in the moment, I just felt like I was supposed to do it. But what the word tells us that generous people, and this is people who live a generous lifestyle, plan to be generous. And they stand firm in their generous. Why do they stand firm in it? Because they had a plan. It's why when it comes to our finances, it's why we budget. As a church, it's why we budget the way we do. Like you, you probably aren't aware of this unless you're kind of a part of our stewardship team or something, but we take our income from the last year and then we budget based on 90% of that. Is that out of fear that we won't bring in enough? No. It's about planning to be frugal so that we have money available to be generous. And in doing that for the last going on three years, God has grown our giving year over year. We leave 10% margin, he gives us that, and another 10 or 12 or 15% every year. Why? Because we planned it. That's why we budget in our households. Sarah and I sat down last night, we were going over one more time, finalizing the budget for February for our household. And there weren't very many changes, a few things we wanted to move around, but guess what we found? We could actually increase how much we give. There was room in there for that because we had a plan. Is that me saying, hey, look at Carrie, he gives a lot? Some of you give way more than I do. It's about we were able to give more to be more generous because we had a plan. Generous people plan. You have to plan your giving. God laid it out this way. It's this first part. It's this first fruit. It's this, this, this tithe. As a church, we give three ways for you to give. In the service, online at farmingtonfirst.com slash giving and text to give where you just use your phone that's in your hand all the time already. Any, any amount to 84321, follow the prompts and you give. There's your giving talk for the day. That's, that's how you, it couldn't be easier. If you want to do it, it's there, it's available. You have to plan your giving. You have to plan your generosity. They stand firm in it. What does it mean they stand firm? It's because they're going to be tested. There's two different kinds of tests that comes with us being generous and giving. The first is the test when there's not enough or doesn't seem like there's enough. And then there's the test when there's more than enough. Have we learned how to make do with a little? Have we learned how to make do with a little more and with a lot? We'll be tested. And then we have to plan our serving. Why do you do what you do? Why do you serve within the church? Why do you give your time? Why did Elisha ask Gehazi, is this a time to accept silver and clothing, olive orchards and vineyards and flocks and herds and all those things? Why did he ask him that? Because you know Gehazi was saying, yes. It's about time we get repaid for everything we do. We've been making oil out of nothing, out of nowhere. We've been filling jars with it. Have, do you... It's like he saw all of that miraculous that had led up to that point and felt like it was finally time for him to get some of it. There was nothing wrong with Elisha receiving that gift. Elisha looked four million bucks plus in the face and said, I don't need anything. Maybe 
Naaman was used to people trying to get something from him. But maybe it was more than that. In Philippians 4, Paul talks about contentment and making do. But Paul was talking to people. That was written to people who had given to him financially. So he could have absolutely used his letter to manipulate them into giving more. He could have. But he made it very clear. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. I'm just letting you know what I have learned because you need to learn it. I've learned how to be content, whether I have a lot or a little. I've just learned how to make do because I can do it because of the one who strengthens me. Elisha didn't want something from Naaman. He wanted something for him. He wanted him to know, beyond his healing, he wanted him to know that Yahweh was the one true God. I didn't read the verse, but in verse 8 of chapter 5, when the king is desperate and freaking out, Elisha says, have him come to me, and he will know there is a prophet in Israel. Why did he want him to come? Why did he want? It wasn't just that he wanted to heal him. He wanted him to know that Yahweh was the one true God. It wasn't about him saying, he'll know that I'm the prophet, and then he'll go and tell everybody, man, there's this amazing prophet over there. He wanted him to know that he was the prophet of the one true God. That the God we talk about, the God we say we serve, the God who we say looks over us and fights our battles, that he is real. So in Philippians 4, Paul later says, verse 16 and 17, For even in Thessalonica you sent gifts for my needs several times. And then he says this, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that's increasing to your account. I don't seek a growing account financially on my end. I seek the growth on your end. It's the same thing. Elisha didn't want something from Naaman. He wanted something for him. He wanted him to be healed and for him to know that Yahweh was the one true God. Paul wanted them. He said, I don't want you to just send more money. I want you to grow. And as you give, there's something that happens in you. How we approach money and possessions reveals how much room we have made for God in our lives. Because God can use people and work in people who are not bound and consumed with greed. With accumulating and consuming and holding on to, with a death grip, the things of this world. Because you can be poor and greedy. It's not about how much you have. It's not about your net worth. It's about what you treat as worthy. And it may be that if I had polled you before you came in again, none of you would have said, I'm greedy. Like we don't, we don't put that as the tagline on our business card. Carrie Weaver, generally pretty greedy guy. Like it's just not on there. None of us think we're greedy. We know people that are. Normally, we think they're all wealthy, right? All the wealthy people are greedy, but you can be poor and greedy, and you can be wealthy and generous. Because if greed has begun to creep into your life, if you're starting to see it a little bit differently, generosity is the antidote to the poison that is greed that infects our hearts and our lives. We have to make room for it. We have to make a plan for it. but we don't often do that. We, we think, when I get more, I'll, then I'll start being generous when I have more. But the, the statistics just don't really bear that out. Actually, if you look at most of the studies, people on the lowest income level give about the same percentage as people at the highest income level. And then it does like this in between. Why is that? It's, it's that most of us, when we are on the way up, when we're on the way up from where we started out, that's where, when I asked you earlier, how many of you ever had to make do with a little? For many of you, you went back to when you just first got married and you didn't have anything. 
And as we're on the way up, our generosity goes down. The number one indicator of generosity is not your net worth. It's not about how much is in the bank. It's about how much room you have for generosity in your heart and in your life. So it, so it doesn't matter. That's, that's the beauty of the economy of the kingdom of God is that he's not impressed with how many zeros there are before the decimal point in your net worth. We see Jesus impressed with people who give sacrificially and generously. That regardless of where you stand, you have the opportunity to make room for generosity in your life. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for holding nothing back from us and exhibiting to make room for generosity in your life.